everybody, um, and thank you for joining us today on uh, this webinar. So today we are joined by Hugh from Searchland. So I'm going to hand over to Hugh in a minute for an introduction, but I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of an overview of what's coming up, first of all. So today we're going to be looking at um, identifying off-market sites using Searchland, but then we're also going to be looking at running residual site values, calculating how much a site is worth. So um, we're going to be doing that by taking a look at both Apreo and Searchland, and we're going to have the opportunity to um, answer any questions. So if anybody's got any questions as we go through today, uh, just answer them, ask them at the bottom in the Q&A section, and we will uh, we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. Um, the webinar is also going to be recorded today, so if somebody needs to run off, no problem. We're going to share that with everybody, and if you want to share it with any colleagues or contacts afterwards, you'll be able to do so. So, let's hand over to Hugh. I'd love to get an introduction, so welcome welcome to the webinar, Hugh. Um, for everybody who's joined us, give us a little bit of an overview of, of, of who you are and who Searchland are. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Hugh, I'm the co-founder of Searchland, uh, and I thought I'd start by saying quickly what Searchland is, um, who we are, because uh, there's four of us, um, and then what it is that we're actually trying to do in this space. So um, Searchland is primarily a site sourcing tool, and uh, it's also a market analysis tool. So what we do is we bring land ownership information into, into one place, along with planning applications, some constraint info and comparable data. We put all this information in, in one place and allow you to identify opportunities that you think look good in your portfolio, uh, de-risk them, and then actually allow you to send a letter to those landowners to say, hey, this is who I am, this is what I'm interested in, let's, uh, let's, let's start a conversation. Um, so that's kind of, that's what we do in this space. It's all online, it's all a web app. Um, but who we are, there's four of us who make the, the team, we're all co-founders. So my background is in planning and real estate. And I studied planning at university, went to work as a graduate planner uh, slash line for land finder. That was my job title. Um, and very quickly realized that I wasn't that into submitting planning applications, didn't really get me that excited. But what was a lot more interesting for me was the, state of data, the lack of data actually, so this is in 2018. Um, and so I very quickly made that 20% of my land finding role about 80%, just because that's what I wanted to do. Um, and was really putting, I was out there collecting information, so on land ownership, on applications, on constraints, and I had a mapping, mapping bit of software that I would use. The idea was that it didn't have quite the, the, ballot, the funding as a uh, planning consultancy to go out and get some of the, the name brand bits of software that are out there at the moment. So I was finding sites. I was then left that job and did it on a freelance basis as a land finder, um, looking at sort of your edge of settlement um, without planning, and then introduced myself on behalf of the landowners. Skip to about two years later, I got a call from a friend who's my now a co-founder, usually sits just there behind me. Um, if you've ever been on a demo call with me, you'll know that there's usually someone there um, saying, you've got to speak to these two, uh, two people I went to university with. They've actually built the back end of what you do. Um, and so pretty much next day spoke to them uh, and put together Searchland. Um, and that was in beginning of 2020. So with an MVP stage in uh, the end of the year and launched in 2021. So fairly quick turnaround. Uh, we're now at a point where it's like, okay, we're out here. We're a real company. Uh, we're a startup status all day long, but it's like, how do we put this in front of as many people and try and show what we're doing a bit differently? Um, and what that is, it's trying to make data more accessible, specifically for sourcing sites and understanding locations. Um, it's trying to make that a bit more affordable because that was always something I was quite sensitive about when I was on the receiving end of many quotes. Um, and it's also trying to look at what's not being done in this space and then trying to build and go around that. So the other three co-founders are all software developers. So we've got fantastic in-house tech. Um, and so that's, that's where we're at now as a business. And so I've got a nice sort of segment to show you on how I would find, find land if I, well, if I was using this, my, luckily my, not luckily, my land finding days are sort of a bit behind me now. Um, hopefully I'll be picking up on it again in the future, um, but not there just yet. 
<laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Hugh. I think I love the journey. And to be honest, I think this is why when we first met, I thought it'd be a great match for, for what we're doing here at A Prayer. Um, so for those of you who don't know who A Prayer are, um, we are a financial modeling tool for real estate. So a bit like you, Hugh, my background was in property before, um, before uh, starting a software company. And for 10 years, I worked as a development finance lender. So I saw appraisals and development appraisals, feasibilities coming into me every day from people looking to secure finance. And most of those people were sending me scrappy Excel spreadsheets. So um, my vision here was to create a new industry uh, standard and standardize that format and that flow of information to basically increase accuracy, uh, increase the efficiency and minimize the risk that's found with human error and overtyping formulas in, in spreadsheets or, or, or other kind of legacy tools. Um, and also bringing that to the cloud. So like, like Searchland, the Preo is a web app, so you can access it on any device. So if you're out on site and you want to run some numbers, you can do so from an iPad, for example, um, making it a very, um, very appropriate for a remote working world uh, that we are all in now. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump over back to uh, back to Hugh. We're going to, Hugh's going to share his screen and we're going to start looking for sites. So over to you, Hugh. Excellent, thank you. So my screen's over here, so if I just turn away, that's what's going on. Let me pull this up and we'll run through it. Cool, I can see that. Excellent, that was the, that was the question I was going to ask. So uh, out of the box, this is, this is search land. This is if you log on, this is where you end up. Um, but I've actually gone ahead and sort of torn a, a town to pieces in terms of a land finding perspective. And that town is Thaxted. So we're going to jump in there and then I'll break down the platform. Um, I'm actually going to make this a bit bigger, I think, for the sake of what's going on. So this is the platform. Uh, we are currently in Uttlesford uh, in a town called Thaxted. Um, I think this is actually one I did a bit of site finding work a few years ago for a developer. So it's one that I'm familiar with. Um, but I thought this would be a really useful place or, or showcase to see the sorts of data that we've got, uh, but more importantly, how you actually leverage and use that data. Um, because of all the sort of site sourcing platforms out there, 50% uh, of them are, uh, or the sort of basis is, is putting data in one place. And then the other 50% of what all of these companies offer is the software around that data. And so I'm really going to try and highlight what it is that we do that's a bit different uh, and how it can help with site sourcing. So this is Thaxted. Um, these are towns that I really like for sourcing because it's they, they kind of they're a bit of a blind spot for the large developers which which move very differently. So you can often find there's there's sort of angles that people aren't looking at. Um, and as it gets more and more competitive, that's obviously a, a strong positive. So let's just clean this up. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on ownership boundaries. Now, ownership boundaries, this comes from land registry. This is who owns what and to what extent. Uh, and we break this down by ownership type. So if it's transparent, then it's privately owned. But if it's blue, it's owned by a company. Great, we've got data from company's house. Uh, purple is council. And then we've got some corporate body that fits on those as well. This is one of the most important layers in search land because it's always on in the background. Uh, so if I do turn it on, I mean, we can move around and it renders. But importantly, if it's off and you think, oh, what about this site? Well, we can still click on that. That sits in the background. And what that allows us to do is this process called a title lookup. And if I pop this open, we can then see lots of information about that title. I'm going to click on a slightly more interesting plot. Let's just go here uh, where we can see this new builds. And from here, uh, we can look at the title number, great. We can purchase the title deed, so we handle that transaction. Uh, we can see who owns this. Now, this is owned by a company, so we do have information. So we can either use this search ownership tool and see what other plots they own, or we can search some company's house and find out a bit more about that company. So that's a link that takes you away from the platform. Uh, we then have some metrics on what's on the plot, so the size of it. Now this looks to be a new build, so it looks like OS haven't brought the data in, but typically we would say, in fact, let's just go on one. We can see a title there, that's what's wrong. We would see the tool at the max height 
from the, the building and the built percentage. So what that is actually built. We can also see use class information and if there are any planning constraints. Um, planning constraints is a great one because if you haven't got the layers turned on, so I'm going to go to this site. Um, let's pop that down. And we can see that this is in the conservation area and it's got a list of building consideration. Now we don't have any of those layers turned on at the moment, but it's saying here's a headline, be aware. We can also see the planning history directly from here. Now this isn't anything too exciting. Any sold prices and EPC records. Why that's important is because then we're using ownership as a bit of a paperclip. If you're ever looking to acquire any land, you're going to go buy a single owner or a collection of owners, but that's what you want to be dealing with. And so that's all the information in one place. In terms of taking this to the next step and using it as a site finding tool, uh, we can do a couple, a couple of things. And so I'm first just going to get rid of these infills just so I'm looking at the boundaries, boundaries only. We then saw that this site was in the conservation area and had a listed building. So in the control center, I can go ahead, turn on our listed buildings there, and there they appear, and conservation areas. I'm also going to go ahead and turn on a few of the other usual suspects. So flood zones, Greenbelt, A and B, Nature Woodland, um, and just close that. So we had a listed building consideration. That's because it's within 50 meters. So we'll sort of say, hey, look, your, it's our attempt to say it's in the curtilage. Now, curtilage is a, is a bit of a planning concept, but it's essentially something you want to be aware of. And I'm just going to clean this up a bit. I'm going to bring our ownership to the top. Now, we're at a point now where we can sort of move around the map. You can look at plots and think, OK, something's standing out about these. And we're, we're, we're effectively de-risking them already because we've got our constraints on. So I can look here and say something's interesting about this plot. We've got a bit of backland and access through here. I like the look of this because there's a, almost a paddock going on at the back, but flood zone's an issue. I'm not so sure about access, so maybe we can't actually go that far, but we can drop our street view down and turn around. Can't quite see it. Access is precarious would, would be what we'd say with that. Um, so that's sort of not something that I'm that interested in. But we're kind of moving around, interested in some of these sites. If we like something, we might want to click on it. So I can take a look at this parcel on the sort of edge of settlement um, and see that there's planning. Uh, and these plannings are actually for residential development. So I'm thinking, OK, instead of just clicking on every title, we can do one better. And I can go back to the control center. But let me zoom out again of Thaxted, control center. And I'm going to open up the, we've got these series of tools. And so a tool in search then is saying, look, here's a data set. What do you want to do with it? Um, and so I can turn on my planning applications. And it should look a bit of a mess, but that's fine. Uh, so what we're doing is we're showing all the planning applications for the last 30 years. Um, and then what I'll do is say, you know what? I only want to see uh, applications that are, so these are some filters where the number of dwellings is greater than zero. So one or more and hit search. Now let's just clean this up a bit. So every point here is a planning application. Um, it's internal color, just clean that up. Internal color is its age. So if it's dark green, it's a nice fresh application. It's pale and white, it's five years and older. Uh, and then importantly, the outside color is its decision. So I've got these red parameters, they refuse. Uh, if it's green, it's been approved. Um, and we've got these yellow ones here for pending decision. Those are live. The council is looking at those. And we can click on these. We can find out a bit more information and go from there. But what's nice about this is if I turn on our ownership again, now we've got quite a nice holistic view of Thaxted from a land finder's perspective. We're looking at ownership. That's what we want to go after. We're de-risking because we've got our constraints on. And we're also going one step further and looking at planning applications and seeing if someone's already had a go. It's kind of up to you whether that's a risk or not. Some people like to go for those. Um, and it really depends on whether you have a short-term strategy, me medium-term or long-term. But the idea around here is we can now move around the map. We can find sites we like. When we like it, we can click on them. And we can save them. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're, there's this idea that land finding is a numbers game, so we want to be collecting a, a, enough leads is what we're doing. We're generating leads, 
And then you want to be in a serious position where you've got, say, 10 good leads, 20 good leads. Um, and then you can actually go after and send them a letter. So with that said, this is something I've wanted to do for a while is so in the projects this is where we save sites and i've got a scenario where it's here's one i've done earlier where i'm in Faxted. i've saved a few sites that to me jumped out pretty i want i didn't want to spend too much time on them because you know there's a low chance that actually get back to me so it's all about numbers and i've gone ahead and assigned them a task uh based on what i've put out here and so some of those could be to purchase the land registry records uh, i've got a column here to send letters to um, I've got a few sites that I picked up that I thought were good, but actually had failed planning. So maybe I want to go and look at the objections. I found a site that was unregistered. So maybe I'll flag it and, you know, down the line a bit, if I'm, if I'm sort of twiddling my thumbs, and I want something hard to do, I might try and find out who owns that site. And then I got sites that on the surface look good, but actually when you, when you start scratching at the surface, there's something not so good about them, no goes. And what that looks like is this. So these are the sites that I had saved. If I turn on my ownership boundaries, we can see that they fit in with the, the boundary because that's what we've saved against. And they're color coded on their various stages. So these have failed planning applications. My red sites are ones that are no goes. And for these ones, it's because they're in the conservation area. Um, purple were sites that I identified as maybe let's purchase the land registry record and let's find out a bit more about them. Uh, and so now we're at a situation where we've done our search, we've looked at ownership constraints, we found sites that we think have potential. And a key thing here is we're, a good way of thinking of this as funnel is we may have started with a thousand sites here. We're now looking at about 20. That's a much more of a human friendly number and that's kind of always the goal here. Um, and so we can then say, okay, what's the next step for this? Let's contact these landowners. Let's actually speak to them uh, because I could give you a thousand sites today unless you actually send them a letter or you know, knock on their door, they're sooner going to end up on someone else's portfolio. So if I go back into site finding, and again, example workflow. So I went through these, I did a bit of due diligence. I decided that I liked them and I marked them with this green. So I, I like to use a red, amber, uh, green signaling system. Um, and what that means is from here, I could go to something like filters and say, show me any labels that are marked with green. I can spell. That's one of the downsides of people watching me do demos is they have to watch me spell and it's pretty atrocious. Um, so these are all my sites that are in green. I've kicked out the ones that I don't want to waste time with. And I'm just going to do one thing. I'm going to move all these and I'm going to move them to letter one because I'm now going to speak to them. So previously it was dragged, then we added that move all button. Now, what's really exciting about Searchland is, yes, you can find sites. Yes, we can give you all this information, but also you can contact these landowners. And so if I just hit this dot, 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 and do send letters, it's going to pull through the title deeds that we've got here. Now, typically, I'd suggest you go via the, the register. Some people like to go to the address and plot. But if you look at the sites that I've been finding, and this isn't the case for everyone, these are all land addresses. So you're not going to have much luck sending a, a letter there. Um, so what you're going to need to do is go by the title register. But this, this board that I've pulled up, this is where you manage your letter sending. So you, you purchase the register, we'll then tell you the owner and the owner's address. And if there's multiple, we'll give you those. We then set a template that we've put in and we send them letters and you run through these and you add them. This is effectively like printing a letter. Now, if I skip back into the second section, letter campaigns, I'll quickly show you my template. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is the this is where the address will go, so we keep that clear. The search land logo is not on these. Um, this is something where you can put your header, and we've got these dynamic fields. So if you've ever done a mail merge before, you'll know what these are. But this is where you can input and make them unique to each letter, uh, and this is what they look like. So you have your fixed your fixed text and then your dynamic text. And so if I get rid of that. And I wanted the sent date simply looks like that. And that's just a template. Uh, we also have the option to include a site plan, uh, which I always recommend because chances are they're getting a few letters. So it helps if they, or they might own multiple plots, it helps if they can just cut through it immediately and see what's up. So 
letter campaigns this is where we actually send them from and so if we can imagine the scenario oh, i don't know that one Lex is getting involved. <laughs> that happens a few times. Uh, if we can imagine a scenario where I've purchased those records, I've, I've prepared the letters for being sent, and then we've got the letter campaigns. These are the ones that I've confirmed, and I can take a look at them. I can pop this open, uh, and that's the, that's the address that came through. This is the custom field. Ooh, this is the custom section that we have, and that's the name that was pulled. And this is my letter, and that's the site that goes to it. This is good to go. So I can quickly check through these, check that I'm happy. And then all I do is confirm letter selection and they are sent uh, as of tomorrow. They'll be printed and posted um, and out they go. And so that is the whirlwind search land tour uh, on site finding, but essentially it's bringing all this information into one place, the ability to identify and de-risk sites. And then we take it that one step further and say, okay, time to contact your owners and go from there. We've got an exciting update to this, which is to run campaigns. So you can set triggers or, 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 or series. So letter one goes out today. Uh, in two weeks time, you want your second letter. And then in six, six months time, we'll send a third letter. And all that is, is one click. Um, one big reason for wanting to even start Searchland was because I didn't see this tool being used anywhere else. But as a land finder, this was the thing that I was asking for most um so it's good to see it in the platform we released it about three weeks ago but always looking to update it as we go so thank you that's pretty much the the platform and um there's a particular site as well that if i was taking this forwards with and i was then thinking okay you know what i do speak to a landowner we're gonna at some point we're gonna not need to start speaking about numbers um and so that's where a preo is an obvious choice in terms of working out uh what you can actually value those at. So this is a really appropriate time to then pass over to Daniel. <laughs> Definitely. So um, thanks, Hugh. That was brilliant. Uh, really good to see. So before, um, before today's uh, webinar, uh, Hugh and I were having a chat and he said, it'd be great to choose an example site like that and for me to demonstrate then how you could calculate the residual site value in a preo. So um, I'm now going to share my screen. I'm going to jump over to a preo and run an example scenario on that site. So um, there's a couple of bits of information that we're going to get from, from Searchland. So first of all, that's gonna be the, um, we want to know where it is. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, here we go. Hugh, could you just confirm you can see that your side? I can, that is bright and clear. Perfect. Okay, so what I'm going to do, uh, well, first of all, actually, this is the Apreo board. So each um, each individual um, user of Apreo has got their own board. So this is a place where all of your projects live. So each one of these cards is a project, um, and you can set your own workflow or pipeline. So when you're prospecting for sites or looking at sites, you might have new projects that you want to review. Um, you might have, I've set mine up as uh, in planning or due diligence and, and live deals. So we can take a site and we can move it through those stages as it progresses. Um, but I'm going to start with the new one. I'm going to use a template which I've set up for a housing development because that particular site that you identified was a um, was basically it looked like it would be suited to housing in a, in a residential area. So I'm going to give it a address, um, which... I don't have the actual address, but don't worry about that for now. We put the address in at the top. That automatically populates a map from our side of things. So it will do it to the nearest uh, residential address or not necessarily residential existing property address um, when it comes into our reporting side of things. We can choose the currency and the areas that we're going to work in for this project. And in my template, I've got some headline information that we may want to uh, include, such as like where the deal came from or links to the planning or uploading documents. Uh, we, can, we can do all that and bring it together in, in one place. Then I'm going to click onto our residual appraisal. So me as a developer, um, a theoretical developer, let's say I, I work on the basis of uh, I've got four house types. So basically like a two, three and a four bedroom house. Um, I then need to work out roughly how many units I can get on that site. So if you do, I mean, just as for theoretically on the base of this site, how many, what sort of density would we be looking at? Roughly how many units would you anticipate? Uh, so I'm actually going to go, there's a site to the south of it. 
um, which is built out, and that was 12 units. Uh, I think 18 is good, for about 50 percent big, 18 units. 18 units. All right, so let's take this as our first scenario. So what, what I've done is I've got my areas of these units. I've got house type A, B, C, and D. So let's just say two, three, four, uh, uh, two bed, three bed, four bed, and five bed houses. Um, we were having a look at Thaxter beforehand and the, the pounds per square foot on average was it was about 340 pounds per square foot, Hugh? Yeah. Okay, so I've made my assumption here that that's 340 pounds per square foot. And that's given me these values, average values per unit. We can obviously, uh, we can change this if we want to, if, if we know the prices, and we can put the override that with the, the value per unit, and that will then give us a pounds per square foot in return. So unlike a spreadsheet, you're never gonna overtype any formulas in here. Uh, everything's dynamically linked. So let's just say, um, how many units did you say, Hugh? Uh, 18. 18. Yeah. Okay, so let's just start building up a, a split of these units. So we'll say go for five uh, two beds, five uh, three beds, and let's do five four beds and three five beds. Uh, so two, three, four, five beds. Just as an example, we built out a very quick schedule of accommodation. I can change this by going back and tweaking these numbers. Um, and I've set this template up with some assumptions. Uh, so I can I can set my sales agents fees and my sales legal fees if I want to, either as a percentage of the GDP or as an amount. And I can add any custom costs into this. And I can also carry on carrying carry on adding any additional units that we want. So we've added in our revenue. The next thing I'm going to do is jump over to the build cost section. Before we focus on the main build, I've got some prelims in the mix here. So these are just standard things like getting our site set up. We might have uh, security and hoarding uh, as an example. So we can just make some high level assumptions for the, uh, for the residual value on this site. Um, but we can also go and add as many of these costs in as we want. So you can add a cost, you can rename it and you can set an amount. When it comes to the build cost, we got 22,850 square foot from that schedule of accommodation that we put together. I can simply bring that into this appraisal by clicking apply. When I do that, I can set a net to gross, but because we're dealing with houses, it's generally uh, 100%. So you're, you're selling what you're building, whereas if it's flats, you're going to be building the, the service areas, the lift shaft, staircases, etc. So we're normally working on about 20% surf, um, surplus area. Now here I can set my bill cost. So we can either do this on a high level assumption like this, where maybe £170 per square foot, or I can go granular and I can go into all of that detail that I want to go into by adding in as many costs as I want. If you set up a template, you can always um, get that customized to the way in which your business works as well. So all of your assumptions are in there when you start off with looking at a site. Next, I'm going to add a contingency just as uh, just to just to make sure that we're looking at things properly. Um, and then in other costs, I've got some uh, other assumed costs that I've pre-populated. So if we put a cost in as a percentage of build cost or a percentage of GDP, that automatically populates the moment that those numbers are in earlier on in the appraisal. So we don't need to manually go through and to add all of these costs in. So we've got things like architects, engineers, QS, marketing costs, etc. Now on the finance side of things, I'm going to make some high level assumptions. Let's just say my bank will lend me 50% of GDP. I've set an interest rate. I've set an estimated term for this project. I'll take it up to 24 months. And the APRO algorithm will calculate an estimated interest cost in the background. This assumes an S curve over the development of the project. So all of this is going on in real time in the background. And this takes us to the most important part of the appraisal process. So I'm just gonna minimize those two sections over on the right hand side and jump into our site purchase tab. So over here, I can set the residual site value that we're targeting, um, the, the target, the return that we're targeting actually. So here I've got 20% return on cost. So I might want to be slightly more conservative and know that my costs are probably gonna creep up. So um, I'm gonna target 25% return on cost as my uh, profit target. When I do that, the pros algorithm will work backwards through all of those inputs. It will take into account the interest. It will take into account the, um, the site purchase legal fees, even stamp duty, and it will give us a residual value. 
Now, if that use class was not residential, let's say it was just land right now, we can, uh, we can change that. And then when I bring this number in, you can see that the stamp duty is automatically calculated and our residual site value has been generated by all of those inputs that we put in. And this is then a live residual value, which we can update in real time. So for example, if that site was actually a residential use class and I change that, you can see that that has changed the stamp duty calculation and that has also changed the residual site value. So I currently have 1.2 million in on my appraisal, but my residual is actually 1.1 or 1.18. So it can have an impact. So it's important to get this data right going in in the first place. Equally, we might want to change our target return. Um, if we are you know, changing that down to 20% or increasing it, you can see again, it's had a knock on effect on that residual value. So what I'm gonna do now is show you how quickly and easy this is to run a couple of scenarios. So without me speaking, we can go through this process literally in a matter of minutes. So you're in search land, you found a site, you've looked at the sales values, you understand the potential massing, um, how many units you can get on site, we want to run some numbers. We can do that in a prayer literally in a matter of minutes. And now the great thing about this is, is the ability to run multiple scenarios. So I'm gonna jump back to the project here. I just click onto the appraisal down here. I'm just gonna move my zoom window. I press copy. I have a new appraisal. I'm gonna click into this. And I'm just gonna say, um, updated planning. Let's say we think that we can get planning in here for an extra four units of our four beds. Like we think that this is going to be, um, yeah, this is gonna hopefully improve our development. So we've got now seven of the, sorry, of the five beds in the mix. I can jump over to the build. I can see that my, um, my, air, my area has increased because we've added new units on. I can press apply. And now I can go to the site purchase and I can see the effect on that residual value. So let's see, let's say now um, on this scenario with those extra units, whilst we've still got the increased cost for those units, our residual site value is actually now increased to 1.5 million. So I can apply that into the appraisal. So you can see how quickly it is to run all of these different scenarios and understand the effect. Um, it can even be as simple as well of like changing your finance. You know, maybe a lender's coming to you with a slightly different proposition where they'll lend you 60% of GDP, but you pay 10% interest. Actually, what's that going to do to your, your residual site value because you're increasing your cost? Therefore, if you want to hit that target return, you're going to have to decrease your offer down to 1.29 million. So it's a really dynamic model and a great way to be able to understand the impact of the sales and the costs on that residual site value. From here, you can also create um, uh, generate reports. So our reports look like this and they cover all of the key data points on the project. So this is ideal for presenting to banks, to investors, um, to stakeholders on the project, it covers all of your return metrics, a full breakdown of all of the units, even things like the site purchase, build cost, finance, um, equity contributions, and then sensitivity analysis. So when I was a lender, we would always look at, you know, how, what's the risk profile of this project? What, what happens if values drop by 10% and bill costs go up by 10%? So like, here's our base case in the middle, 20% return on cost for this project. If the GDP goes down by 10%, we're making a 9% margin. If build costs go up by 10%, then we are making a 2% return on cost. So this is a really powerful tool and this table is updated real time when you're tweaking your numbers um, to understand the real risk profile of a project. Obviously the more green, the better. <laughs> and uh, you wanna make sure that you are stress testing because with the way that build cost and uh, material prices are going, the reality is, is that, you know, there's, it's gonna be moving up in this direction somewhere, um, which is gonna have an impact on your profit margin. The final thing I'll mention in, um, in a prayer as well, before we answer the questions, is the ability to work as a team. So we've, we've started working on some numbers here. Let's say that I want, to, um, I want to engage with my colleagues on this. I could do two things. I can either share a project with them 
using our unique and secure link-based sharing. So this is great for internal or external. But if you're sending this to an investor, a stakeholder, a JV partner, we can literally send a project over to somebody using this link. I'll just show you what it looks like for them. It's like that read-only view. Um, we've then got this. This is a live link. So if you update your numbers, the person on the receiving end will be able to actually see what's changing and what's going on on the project. And if they're an Aprea customer or have their own Aprea board, they can actually save a copy of that project to their board using that button, button in the top right without the need to manually enter that data. And a bit like you, Hugh, when I was uh, a lender, like we would receive deals from developers and we would manually take their numbers and put them into our own Excel-based appraisal line by line. So having, like, like where you were saying, the sending out the letters was the bit that you were crying for or craving when you were in that role. This is exactly the same for me. Um, so having that ability to literally save that information in one click is very powerful. Um, the final point here is the ability to share this with your team. So we've got our original appraisal, which was here. If I want to work with my colleagues, I can then send that to my team board, it jumps over and on our team board here, we've got the ability to be able to jump in and work together with our colleagues on that project. So now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're going to see which questions have rolled in. So um, if you haven't asked your question yet, please do so on the uh, on the Q and A, which is down at the uh, at the bottom uh, bottom right of the screen. And we do have two questions already. <laughs> so um, Nick has asked. He currently uses Nimbus Maps. Would love to hear the elevator pitch from Searchland. But that did come in at the very beginning of the webinar. So maybe you've already answered that one. Yeah, I can. I, I mean, I'll, I'll touch on it again. So. <clears throat> Obviously, we've had the benefit of entering into the market uh, after Nimbus and Nimbus has been around. So how we do things a bit differently. Um, and so this is an elevator pitch on points of difference. So I hope that's all right. Is uh, we've put a lot more emphasis on searching. Now that searching can be searching for planning applications. It can be searching for comparables. It can just be moving around the map or finding plots of a given criteria. Uh, and what searching is also linked to is user interface. How user friendly is it? And so we've put most of our, or a lot of the early effort into just trying to make something that's intuitive and user friendly um, and, and nice to be on. So point of difference is always a different one for these platforms because we all get our data from the same place, right? So there's only one place to get ownership. There is only one place to get plan applications provided you collect them yourself. Um, same with comparables data and constraints. So what we do is, is really focus on that software around it. How do we make it user friendly? How do we link the data? That idea of clicking on a, a title, a land ownership parcel and seeing everything about that. That's one of those sorts of uh, points of difference, as well as things like the letter sending tool, um, which granted I sort of got to at the end of that. But that's that really makes SearchSign one of the few platforms or only platforms where you can find a site. And you can find a site on Nimbus, you can find a site on the other platforms but actually contact them. And so I speak to businesses all the time who are like, yeah, we've got 600 sites. We're just waiting for the time. And that to me is madness because there is an element of time pressure on almost all of these sites because it's increasingly competitive. Uh, everyone's on a platform or something similar to, to this. And uh, <laughs> when you find a site, if there's nothing, nothing in the way but getting the letter out the door, um, it seems to be a pretty crucial one um, that you can stay on top of. Yeah, I think that's a good, a good response. Um, okay, Caroline has asked, are you guys able to introduce a measuring tool into search land, which would allow you to measure plot size uh, along the boundaries, similar to what ProMap offers? Yeah, so would this be, uh, let me try and answer both of these. So plot size we have, that's one of the title, the plot features, so we'll tell you the area of the site. Um, but by the sounds of it, you're after the perimeter um, of the actual boundary. Now, technically we have that information sitting in the back end. we just don't display it. Um, we also have a measuring tool, so you can tap, 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 hit the boundary and check the perimeter as well as the area again of that site. Um, there are a few new metrics we're looking to add over the next month or so. Um, I'm hoping that'll be one, so you won't have to measure, it'll just be there, but we do also have the measuring tool. Cool. I think that's a good answer. Um, okay. Um, Tapiwa asked, is this going to be recorded and shared? Simple answer, yes. 
Um, and then we've got another question from Tim. So Tim has asked um, bulk letter sending and, and the way to bulk move uh, across columns looks good. Is there a charge for letters sent within the platform or is that included within the subscription? Yeah, yeah. So there's still a charge. It's uh, we these letters are still sent by Royal Mail, so that's the service that we're sort of using. Um, mind you, we don't send the letters ourselves. In terms of costs, it's a sliding scale. So we use a credit system, um, and what that means is that if you buy ten credits, you're looking at one pound fifty a letter. But if you go up onto our if you go up onto our sort of uh, larger credit package, you're down to seventy p per letter. So that's a lot more appropriate for what people are used to paying. Credits don't expire. If you know you're going to send 100 letters, 1,000 letters, and you know this is a tool you can depend on, then there's sort of a, a, a natural lean towards the cheaper options. But about 70p to 80p is what most people are currently on. I feel like that's very good value for money for the time that it would save. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay, no, that's that's fantastic. Um, and then there's one final question that's come in um, that I can see. Obviously, we've probably got time for um, for one or two more. So feel free to ask a question um, if you've got one. Nick has asked, am I able to export my Nimbus workflow over to Search Land? <laughs> <laughs> that's always a good sign when that question comes up. Um, it depends. It depends. Um, there are there are a few sort of ways of doing it. It's really about understanding quantity, um, how those sites are saved, what what you've added to them. Um, the short answer is yes, um, but there's a whole conversation that goes on behind it. It's it's not something that's that's like um, plug and play, but it it's, it's been done in the past. And for for to to answer that question without going into it, the most sites we've ever transferred over has been fifty thousand. So. Um, Hopefully that answers. We don't usually charge for that service either. Um, That's so great. hopefully that tiptoes around the edge of my answer. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, the, Kerry has uh, asked about what the charge is, but it's probably, um, you probably want to handle those conversations offline. Um, but so, well, I'll leave, it, I'll leave that up to you. It, yeah, I mean, we, one of the big things we've done is we've tried to drop the price as much as possible, looking at the competition around. Um, and so our platform is from thirty-five pounds to eighteen uh, to one hundred and seventy pounds per month. In terms of costs, it's about jumping on a trial. It's all about usage. It's do you work in a team, and we'll try and fit you on a platform that is matches your criteria. Um, so that part of the conversation is very much one to one. Uh, typically, the prices that we have, we're, so we are due to re renew them, um, but it's just a sort of few tweaks here and there. Uh, but it's really based on your your levels of, of use. No, I think that's a, a, a great response. So one one final question here from Darren, um, who had to step out. So he apologizes if it's been asked before, but it hadn't. So no worries, Darren. Um, is the search for England only or can it be used in Scotland? Uh, we get this a lot. Um, Scotland, we have some data for. We have we're in an interesting position where we've got a hundred percent of Scotland planning applications, but land registry is held differently. We don't have ownership data, and at the beginning of the intro, I said that that's the most important data set that we have. Uh, we also don't have constraint data and comparables data. So the short answer there is no. Um, it's sparse unless you're looking for a glorified planning application finder. Um, but we are looking to fill that in. Wales is sort of an in-between. We've got good data for that, but Scotland and Wales, hopefully by the end of next year, it would be up to scratch as to where England is. Fantastic. I right. say end of, next year, end, of, end of this year. <laughs> oh, well, even better. Um, I, look, I think that's pretty much all we got time for. Um, so uh, if people want to find out more, how can they contact you? you? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn is a big one for me. Um, but to be honest, if we're going for LinkedIn, I'm very quickly going to hand over to emails. So you can have, get to me at hugh at searchland.co.uk um, or go via our website, searchland.co.uk. Um, I'm pretty sure I pop up <laughs> on an instant message chat, um, which is convenient because I don't really leave this spot here. So you can reach me via there. Um, we also offer free trials. That's a great way just to jump onto the platform, play around with it. It's seven days, but if you book in for a demo, I'll put another seven days on the clock. Um, it's more about you actually being able to use the thing than saying time's up. So yeah, email, LinkedIn, and via the website. 
Fantastic. And also for Repreo, um, we do, we too have a seven day free trial. So for anybody who would like to sign up for that, you can do so directly through the website at apreo.com. So aprao.com. And yep, my name is Daniel Norman. I'm also on, on LinkedIn and can be reached at daniel at apreo.com. So look, Thank you, everybody, for joining. I uh, really appreciate you taking uh, taking some time out of your day. And thank you, Hugh, for joining as well. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Nice one. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And take care. Cheers. Bye.